I am the fourth generation here in Napa. I really feel like the cemetery is the anchor to the history here to the valley. George Yant was the first white settler here in the Napa Valley. He came here in 1831 and when he saw this when he saw this valley he said it was paradise and he wanted to live and die here which which he did. In 1836, this was still under uh, Mexican territory, and George Yant um, worked for General Vallejo and the Padre over at the Sonoma Mission Inn. And in lieu of money, he received a land grant um, that included this property, which was called uh, Camus Rancho. Cemetery has holds so much history and so much culture. There's actually a burial ground for the Native Americans that also lived here and also worked for George Yaunt. He hired the local American Indians, Native Americans, and um, and the history says up to a thousand at one point he employed. There were five tribes in the area, and um, most of them very very friendly. Matthias and Vandalore, who you see here, who was the first generation of my family that settled in Yontville back in the 1870s. My father, Lee Hart, came involved with the cemetery in 1865 after his mother and father passed away um, within a few months of each other. Um, he wanted to make sure that their grave sites were taken care of and he knew this was such a sacred space and it carries such amazing history and culture of this valley. You know what I love about the cemetery is that it's true to time. It really hasn't changed since I was a kid. It's, um, it's not manicured, it's natural. I'm Stephanie Levitt. I'm the Area Director of Sales and Marketing at Bartosono Hotel and Spa and Hotel Yachtville. We can teach anyone to serve you a glass of coffee. Anyone can do that. But to do it with heart and to have a passion for what you do and to love that industry, and that takes something really special. You can't teach someone how to really love what they do. And everyone comes with different life experiences that you can learn from and see their craft in the different areas, whether it's walking through the kitchen uh, and seeing the chefs making back then sculptures in the kitchen and going to the pastry shop and seeing all the beautiful things that the pastry chef would be making at the time. So I think each of those different crafts in hospitality is also what makes it exciting. The concept of the art at this property was created when the hotel opened. Because this was a location where we saw there would be probably a, a big demand of repeat guests, uh, we wanted there to be something that was unique each time the guest came. So, the unique thing in partnering with Andrea Schwartz Art Gallery is as all of these pieces are here, they're only here until the piece sells and then a new one comes in its place, which I have to say as somebody who works here every day, when we walk around the corner and see a new piece of art, even as employees, everybody's excited to see, oh, what's this art and what, what was the concept behind it? And, is really interesting to see who reacts to what pieces and um, the one that is made of rulers. I like to ask guests when we walk past them, do you know what this is made of? And everybody has to go over and like look at it and touch and feel it. Or we have an artist that makes beautiful portraits with 
uh, old newspapers and magazines. And so it's interesting as guests realize, oh wow, these are what these pieces are made of. Um, it makes it exciting, I think, for them to explore the property again and again on each visit or even walking around during the daytime and saying, oh, I didn't even notice that during the day. So this is the Julian piece that I was telling you about that is one of my favorites here around the property. And what I love about this piece is how as guests see it as they're coming around the corner, it seems just like a solid sculpture, gentleman's head. And as they start moving around it, they see that it's these slices and they're seeing through to see the pictures behind it. Uh, the piece transforms in the night as well as in the daytime. It looks totally different. I'd like to think that I'm an artist in hospitality, that uh, it's something that I'm passionate about and it is um, something I love sharing with people and hope that uh, they can see that same passion and take it into other parts of their life. I'm Michael Chiarello, chef owner of Ortega Restaurant and Coqueta Restaurants. When I was in kindergarten, my first little thing I had, I had to write was, was I said, I'm going to be a cook and own a restaurant one day. My mother and father from southern Italy, Calabria, a very poor region of Italy, and um, we grew up very poor. My father was disabled when I was young, and so we had a small farm in the, a couple of hours from here in the country, and we lived our life, the celebration of life was through food, and the seasons of the food and how it worked, from growing ourselves, from growing, raising animals, foraging, from uh, hunting, fishing, and the preservation of all, of all of that. My mother was my best friend. She was a phenomenal cook, and all of my family were cooks. They were butchers, cheesemakers. Being poor didn't matter. It didn't matter. Our, our lives were so rich with each other. Making people happy with food, being and appreciating and loving the thought of being a servant to your guests and serving a celebration for them and expressing yourself at the same time is a great gift. It's the only thing in my life that I can do that, that nobody could touch. Right? To me, in, in my world, I always say that you earn the right to creativity, you're not born to it. You're not born to it. I always believed that I'm a craftsman. We cook again and again and again. Um, that's a craftsman, but I think it goes on for infinity. As soon as you're getting close to what you think is perfect, it changes. It's the, it's the march toward perfection. As we all say, it's the journey. Yes, there's plenty of art in what we do. There's plenty of craft in what we do. And the combination of the two are what makes it interesting to me. There are a lot of very talented cooks in America using phenomenal ingredients and exquisite technique, artistically presented. But you wake up in the morning often not having a relationship with that consumption, with that food. You wake up having something, but it wasn't something. It was, it was something that was made to be something, but you don't know what it is. It doesn't have an ilk to anywhere in your life. We like to take things that most people would understand and turn it upside down and present it in a way that they might not imagine. That's the art of what we do. Art is impenetrable to me. Um, the, the sits as an icon, a, a goddess to be, to be honored and, and, and revered. Charles Boisset, propriétaire de la Maison Boisset.
I was very fortunate to be born in Burgundy, in France, in the heart of the pinnacle of the finest wine ever, Vougeot, at the foot of the Clos Vougeot, the oldest monastery of fine wine in the world of Pinot Noir. Clos Vougeot is the Grand Cru. My parents started in the living room making wine, so I was very fortunate to be able to make wine since birth. I was meant to be part of the wine world and within the wine world and the catalyst of creativity within the wine world. I use wine as the catalyst of my creativity, but I embrace design, architecture, jewelry making, fragrance, designing, and all of the above to create experiences that go beyond wine. I use wine to be the catalyst of who I am and to bring people together. What I want to create always is to engage you to think differently about where you sit, how you sit, why you're sitting where you sit, and what you feel when you sit. So this is a sofa which is meant to be together. So if we get closer, it's an egg. And I love feathers because I love to fly. I love to escape. I love to wander in another world. So. I designed this beautiful egg-shaped sofa. We could sit four of us or two of us. We could propose right there together. Cheers. Now, I don't want you to be engaged through this wine, through the technical aspect of it. I'm interested in getting your emotion. And this is why this is very unique. This wine allows us to be able to do that because it's a product of civilization. It's one of the oldest alcoholic, naturally made, fermented beverage of all time. For 7,000 years we've been enjoying wine, whether it's in India, whether it's in China, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in Africa, whether it is in the Muslim world, the Jewish world, the Catholic world, the Hindu world, or within the world of China and the world of Buddhism and any part of it. So it's a form of philosophy. So the key is to be able to fulfill in your mind the dream that you have. Don't think of it, do it. I'm James Moore. I'm a sculptor working out of uh, San Jose, California. I grew up uh, in the Central Valley of California, a little town called Carruthers, which is near uh, Fresno. Nobody knows or cares where it is, but that's where I made my first art piece. At the point that I made that first piece, I didn't know really that's what I was doing. I was kind of bored one summer and uh, went out to hang out under one of the old trees next to the chicken coop, because you know every farm has a chicken coop. And um, I saw this piece of sawed off branch and as clearly as I can see your face now, I could see there was a face in there. And so I just, I went and found a, you know, carpenter's chisel and hammer and just started whittling away, carving away until um, the face was revealed. After five or six hours, um, that piece was done and I looked up and just my, my world had changed. I, it completely changed the way that I see the world, which is, um, always looking for what's under the surface. This was more akin to a spiritual experience than a creative experience. It was the first time I'd been in touch with the process of having a vision for something, doing something physical to make that vision come about, and then actually doing that thing. So each piece from my Balancing Act series, there is the figure, which is in balance in some way. Um, the focus of the piece really though is the element that's being balanced and sometimes that's a series of sort of graduating spheres, uh, sometimes it's, it's like a collection of, of, of abstract elements. The meaning, as with all abstract art, is intended to be a little open-ended, sort of create space for us to bring our own experiences to the piece and then we get to decide what each of those elements might mean. Being able to say I'm an artist is kind of a big deal, especially when you're just starting out. It's like, who are you to be an artist, right? Which is, I think, one of the benefits of going through art school, because somebody gives you that stamp and says you're an artist. But if you're not, if you're self-trained, then you have to give yourself that stamp, right? Um, for many years, I didn't call myself an artist. I called myself a sculptor, because that felt real, tangible, provable. Society says, 
these are the things you can do, be, have. And if you pursue anything outside that, nobody validates that. Not your friends, not your parents, no established anything, of course. And so we have to find ways to give that validation to ourselves. And that's true no matter what you do. If you're doing something that nobody expects you should be doing, you have to give yourself permission. And it's a hard thing because you have no point, you're like, you have no point of reference, right? You have no, nothing to bounce that idea off of. I respect the gifts and talents, I guess, that I've been given. Um, and I do my best not to waste them. And so I have to earn that every day I'm in the studio, which is why I spend so much time in the studio. We need to accept ourselves. If we have an impulse, an inclination, even a faint desire to do something, you know, that's not illegal or hurt somebody, do it. Really, nobody can give us that, um, that permission. And even when they do, it's not really worth anything. Um, nobody can come in and say, hey, you're a great artist, and then have that make you be a great artist. You have to do the work, um, and you have to go through the self-doubt, all of the, the stuff that doesn't work out. You have to go through all that stuff because it, it helps shape and form your own visual vocabulary. My name is Ivy Zomer and I do watercolors. Artist is definitely difficult for me to, to say because I'm not trained. It just feels like a very uncomfortable space, like I haven't earned it. I've always been creative. Um, I grew up in a very small town, remote, so I was always doing things with natural materials. I was making mud pies. I was watercoloring, uh, you know, but with the smaller set and just always doing things outside and very creative, but didn't feel at that time that was my path. So I went towards culinary and became a pastry chef. And then I realized sometime after I met my husband that that might not be something that I want to do lifelong. So I went back to school and pursued a career in dentistry. Most of my family is in dentistry and so it felt like it was kind of a natural part of the conversation and as they say you know the figure of speech it's in your blood so I went back and became a dental hygienist. I'm still doing dentistry I still consult um, that's what pays the bills <laughs> uh, but I'm shifting this I'm definitely taking the art more seriously and focusing more of my time. I paint six or seven days a week I, it's the first thing I do in the morning uh, even before the coffee. I just, I wake up, I think about what I want to paint or what I saw the day before on my walk through Yonville or something that just inspired me, a shape, a shadow, a color. And I'm just so excited to get to my desk and start painting and it just brings me so much joy. It feels like a calling in a sense. I'm just so passionate about it shift is um, hopefully happening to where maybe I can make this uh, more of a career and kind of lean into more of that entrepreneurial side of, of artistry and hopefully people will enjoy it and the whole goal is just to make them happy. When I create something I don't even feel like I, I'm the person that created it. It's like I get lost in it for hours and I just and then I come back and I look at the piece and I went who did that? And, and it's hard for me to say, Ivy did that. But I see the signature and I see the work and I know what inspired me to do it, but it, I just don't feel like I'm wearing an artist's hat. It's just me doing my thing. When you maybe take the social pressures of what you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to look like or how you're supposed to act or perform or what, what the art's supposed to look like and you just you just shed that off and you just think about what you want to create, the colors you want to use, the emotion you want to create, and you just go to your purest 
self, which I think is like your child self. I mean, this is what I was doing when I was a little girl. I was creating stationery. I was painting. And, and I think I pushed that way, way, way down because I needed to be a professional and I needed to go to school and I needed to get my master's and I needed to achieve, achieve, achieve. And, and now I think as I've gotten older, I've just become more comfortable with myself and listening to myself and then just creating what Ivy wants to create. Life is so precious, especially when we slow down. And there's a creative soul, I think, in all of us.